Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to February's um, monthly meeting from CamCycle. We're joined this evening by um, Rhiannon Osborne from the Cambridge uh, and Peterborough um, Commission on Climate and Helen Dye from St Ives Eco Action, uh, Eco Action Group. So um, people will be aware that the combined authority and the mayor have a, an ambition to meet their zero carbon target and for in order to sort of help them achieve that set up um, an ind independent commission on climate change which was established to research and provide recommendations on how the region could best decarbonize so decarbonizing the economy and also of course um, how we can adapt um, to climate change as well so Rhiannon Osborne um, is here representing um, the work that she does as part of that organization and we're also lucky enough to be joined by Helen Dye, who's the organiser of St Ives Eco Action Group. Um, and she's here to really to explain how her local group aims to build on kind of the community that she has and how they are, as a result, able to help achieve net zero by 2030. So thanks so much, ladies, for, for agreeing to join us this evening. Um, we're going to start by inviting Rhiannon to talk a little bit about the um, recommendations um, from the CPICC and, um, and tell us a little bit more about her role um, within that. And then we'll hand, hand over to Helen to talk to, about her, the regional group, before we open the floor to questions. So Rhiannon, over to you. Great, perfect. Um, thank you so much, everyone. It's really nice to be here. So my presentation today is mostly going to be about the work that I did on the commission as the one of the co-leads for the Just Transition um, kind of programme of work at the commission. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means, what that means locally. Um, but I realised when I just finished making this presentation about five minutes ago that I hadn't really put in enough on the transport specific recommendations. So we can come back to that in the questions um, if people have kind of more detailed questions about the transport specific recommendations, um, which I'm sure lots of people will have. Um, but I personally think the narrative around just transition and building that into all environmental work, whether that's transport, whether that's food or housing, is, is really, really important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so I am, yeah, one of the independent commissioners on the um, Cambridge uh, and Peterborough Independent Commission on Climate, um, but do lots of other things as well. Um, so sometimes you'll hear me talking in a commissioner capacity, sometimes I talk in an activist capacity or as a researcher capacity. Um, my role on the commission is mostly because of my research on health inequalities and their relationship to climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, so that's kind of the focus of my work. Um, but I'm also a medical student. Um, I do a lot of local community work, mostly on food system stuff um, and do a lot of work nationally on ending oil and gas expansion in the UK. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so, yeah, so thank you, Rosie, for saying a bit about the background of CPICC. Um, but basically, we have a long name, which shortens to a slight, quite still quite a long acronym. But basically, we're a group of um, different like experts, although I don't really self-define as, as an expert, um, who advise the CPCA on climate mitigation and adaptation policies. Um, and then so we kind of act as an independent advisory, make recommendations, and then CPCA and others hopefully take those forward. Um, so we published the full report in October of last year, um, just after an interim report, which was published in March. And um, we looked at a number of different sectors, including transport, obviously, but also buildings, business and industry, peatlands, nature, waste adaptation and energy. Um, and the recommendations were accepted at the CPCA board in November, which is really, really great news, um, but very important to see that as the start of action and the start of changes rather than, okay, they've been accepted, now we can all go to sleep. Um, and as part of, basically as um, particularly coming from like a 
community mobilization background, I was really keen and so was the rest of the commission to make sure that we included a lot of public engagement work in our um, advisory role. Um, and I think something that will hopefully come out of my presentation is that it's really important to see local communities as experts in their context, in their challenges, in their visions for the region. Um, and we wanted to treat people like experts. So a lot of the report, in particular, the Just Transition chapter, is written um, by people we engage with. I would describe myself as having edited, edited it and convened it um, rather than having um, written it. And going forward, so now that we've published this first major report, um, we're going to be having a more monitoring role, um, reviewing progress um, and inputting into particular local policy issues if we're requested to, um, and if needed, going into deep dives on areas that maybe we didn't cover in as much detail as we could have done in the reports. But basically, the majority of the content from the Commission is out in the October report, um, and we're hopefully what we'll be doing is um, monitoring and accountability and maybe adding a few things. Um, so some of the kind of big takeaways from the report, um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail on, um, but basically emissions in the region are particularly high. Um, and a really big part of this is actually the transport emissions. Um, some of that is because we have um, heavy goods vehicles, but that doesn't actually really account for how high the emissions from transport are. Um, and that is because there is pretty extreme inequality and in access to good quality public transport in the region. Um, so com Cambridge compared to other areas of the region um, is a completely different situation for people. Um, and um, also in particular with jobs being concentrated in Cambridge um, and, and some of the other towns, um, there really is not that many options for people other than cars. Um, but that, yeah, that does mean that we have about six years before we've used up our allowed share of emissions by 2050, which is a slightly ridiculous number. Um, and the region is also at high risk from a changing climate. Um, we are quite a low-lying region, really vulnerable to flooding. We're a high food producing region, um, which means that our food production is vulnerable to changing climate. Um, but there are also lots of benefits um, to be gained locally from acting on climate if the policies are designed in the right way. Um, and I will come on to that in a little bit. Um, but also it's gonna be a lot of money, but um, we've had we've done um, kind of economic analysis as part of our recommendations. And most of the recommendations are either cost effective or cost neutral. Um, there's only a few of them which actually result in a loss. Um, and even then it's not really a loss. Um, so yeah, so there's like huge um, benefits um, which do require a lot of investment, but the events investment um, based on the analysis does look like it will pay off. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my work as the kind of co-lead for the Just Transition chapter um, and kind of what a Just Transition means. Um, so here are two kind of really good uh, quotes about what a Just Transition means. Um, and the first one focuses on how a just transition means that we design policies that ensure the benefits of climate action are shared widely and the costs are not unfairly burdened on those least likely to pay or those whose livelihoods are directly impacted um, as we change the economy and the way we live. Um, and I really like the addition from the IPPR Environmental Justice Commission, which is that a successful transition means that people have to be at the heart of the policy making process. Um, so there were a couple of different aspects to this locally um, in the work that we in the work that we did on what a local just transition would look like. Um, and yeah, just to emphasize that this is kind of the start of the conversation on a just transition rather than, OK, we've written this chapter. Nobody else can have any opinions. Um, but basically, when we talk about fairness in climate action, a lot of this it kind of reflects how the people who are going to be most impacted by the climate crisis are the people who are least responsible. So that applies globally in the sense that rich countries are far more responsible than poor countries, um, but it also applies um, locally and regionally in that it tends to be wealthier people who have much higher kind of per household emissions. Um, it tends to be companies who produce an awful lot of emissions. Globally, 71% of emissions are produced by 100 companies. Um, so again, there's a real kind of inequality in who's responsible for the majority of this crisis and who's actually going to face most of the impacts. So in the UK in particular, um, poorer communities are at much higher risk of things like flooding, um, overheating of housing um, and the other impacts of the climate crisis. 
which means that not only does that need to be taken into account, but we also need to think about how we take into account and tackle inequality as part of climate action. Um, so that means not burdening low income households, but it also means holding to account people who people and companies and organizations who can and should change. And it also means recognizing that if you are living in poverty, if you are struggling to put food on the table, your capacity or to um, kind of make change is very different to someone who's living comfortably. Um, so that's kind of a really big, important or, um, aspect of fairness. Um, Co-benefits is another really big, important action. And I think this is, this is especially kind of pertinent when it comes to transport, is that it's very important that we talk about action on the climate crisis, not as this bad thing is going to happen and so we can stop it here. That's one part of it. But another part of it is this is an opportunity to create a holistic vision for an alternative way of living, which is better for the planet, but also better for the people locally, for people across the world. Um, and that's where co-benefits really comes in. And it also helps to root climate action in the daily challenges that people are facing today. So like, is it difficult to get to work, right? Yeah, there's a problem for you. It's an, in it's an inequality problem. It's also a problem for the climate. It's also a problem for community health. Um, and some really particular examples of this locally, locally are access to public transport, fuel poverty and food poverty, um, both of which are quite high in the region. Um, and yeah, there's a quote down there from someone from our community engagement, which I think is really, really important, um, talking about how people are disadvantaged by not being able to access public transport. Um, so it's really important that as well as talking about what we don't want, we talk about what we do want and opportunities for like Im improving quality of life for a lot of people. Um, and then the third pillar of kind of just transition work is community involvement. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like I can talk a little bit about the work we did and the panels that we had as part of write writing this report for the commission. Um, but essentially, as I said earlier, it's about treating people as the experts that they are in their own circumstances and in their own community. Um, not only because it's the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. And I can say that from running these consultations, there were not an awful lot of policy recommendations which we came up with as independent experts that people in the community didn't also come up with in the consultations. So there is a real wealth of ideas and of knowledge that can be tapped into. Um, and allowing people to ideate is something that's really, really important. So it's not saying, okay, here's a survey, do you want X or Y? And saying like design this like what does this look like how do we create this together um and on the left is a um kind of one of the outcomes from the consultations that we did um was that at the start of every consultation we invited people to say one thing which they would see if they woke up in 2030 and the region was the region that they wanted to see um and that's really really beautiful so i think yeah, that's really nice i like that um and in these consultations, I think what also comes is really important comes out of like deep, meaningful community engagement that allows people to engage with these topics properly um, is that you find out what the actual problems are, not what you think the problems are. Um, and so here are some of the kind of key issues that were talked about, in particular barriers and challenges, and I can come on to again, I can come on to more detail about the transport stuff later. Um, but one of the key things that came out of transport was that everyone felt that individual car use is the easiest and cheapest option for people at the moment. Um, and, and people felt that people felt that there was a lack of imagination about what alternative cities looked like. People were like, I find it hard to imagine a city without cars, like how would that work? Um, and yeah, people felt that they like needed kind of not only practical help, but also social movement he kind of helped to change that um and the lack of connection between villages and towns outside the city centers um was yeah like really really important for people um and so lots of people particularly from the fens felt that conversations around transport can be removed from the reality of rural living um and how you implement alternatives to cars in rural areas um and from these engagements, what we did was we kind of came up with principles for a just transition in Cambridge and Peterborough. Um, and yeah, these are much more elaborated on in the report, um, but it basically talks about when you're making climate policy. And what we've done is recommend that this is used as a climate policy assessment tool is are you meeting these, I think there's 11 on there, criteria. Um, 
so talking about do no harm but bold ideas and leadership because you know like winning slowly in the climate crisis is the same as losing um and considering sustainability for everything meaningful communication um making sustainable choices the most affordable the most convenient and the safest centering local decision making protecting people on low incomes embracing the natural world fairness locally nationally and internationally um, and making sure that everyone has a part to play um, but also people who are not playing their part are appropriately kind of reprimanded um, but, and by that I usually mean um, kind of people polluters, polluting companies, not necessarily individuals. Um, so these are some of the recommendations that have come out for from the just transition. Um, and I won't go into these because I think I'm running out of time and um, uh, I'll send these slides out. But basically we've put out some, as well as the kind of recommendations on specific topics, we have recommendations about deep, meaningful community engagement, um, which involves like inclusion working groups to especially involve people who are left out of climate and policy discussions, which often includes um, people of color, low income communities, young people, people with disabilities, and how like making sure that climate policy making actively reaches out to communities who have been left behind by previous policy making to make sure that it's not replicated. Um, and another specific recommendation that we made was that as part of delivering the targets, the CPCA actively supports grassroots initiatives um, that can help the region meet those targets because it's not just a government issue, it's not just an industry issue, um, it's at the heart of the communities and our behaviours and how we live with each other in the land. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really important to share. Um, and this is my last slide um, and kind of some of the things I see as challenges going forward. Um, implementing recommendations is always a challenge um so like actually how do we like hold people accountable to accepting the recommendations um and getting people comfortable with the scale of the change required both individual people and communities um but also policymakers. um financing we have some recommendations about the cpca using its pretty extensive borrowing powers um but making like kind of ensuring that that finance happens is really important um and connecting the local to the national it, it, local government does have many challenges related to its own relationship with national government um and i think for all of us i think um i don't know if anybody saw this headline i think it was from one of the state's newspapers and it was like oil and gas expansion off xy coast of the us cancelled in win for environmentalists and i kind of felt like the idea that a livable planet is a win for environmentalists is um uh, yeah very <laughs> problematic um so i think redefining environmentalism is really important and like amy westervelt who's a brilliant commentator does great work on this and that really requires intersectionality and not talking about the climate crisis as a standalone issue but an issue that is deeply deeply related to inequality and deeply related to the actual quality of life that current systems are allowing us to live um and especially for people doing campaigning and like from my work in campaigning outreach and capacity building um you know like we're all here because we already care what about people who don't yet care like how are we reaching into communities and bringing people on board how are we building coalitions with union groups um with student strikers you know like how how are those coalitions being formed um, and how can we kind of implement what we talk about as well as talk about it. Rhiannon, thanks ever so much for that whistle stop tour. There's obviously been a huge amount of work um, that's gone on behind the scenes there. And it's really, really um, good to, to hear about some of, not only some of the recommendations, but also the really significant work that you've obviously done um, to, as you sort of summarise there, to think about how environmentalism is really about uh, or inextricably linked with inequality and the livability of, of areas for all of us. Um, so thank you so much for what you started off with um, this evening. We're going to pass on now to hear from um, Helen Dye, who's the organiser of St Ives Eco Action Group. And um, Helen, uh, Helen is obviously working in a, in, a, in a small local group and her work is really about how we can achieve net zero um, on a very local level, um, as Rhiannon said, on a sort of grassroots level. So Helen, over to you. Thank you. 
thanks, Rhiannon. That's a really good uh, overview of what the, uh, the Independent Climate Commission have been up to. Um, and I think it's really interesting that uh, you are keen to see that equity is absolutely addressed. And I know I've recently got interested in collective impact initiatives and the sort of theory and constructs behind that. And one of the reasons why they fail is because equity is not addressed. And so there's a huge amount of academic learning that we can all draw upon around collective impact initiatives. And I think the challenge for me, um, I've worked in academia, I've been a health researcher, project manager, fundraiser. Um, I'm also very much a grassroots person as well. So I can fly in the domain of policy and strategy, but I will get great satisfaction from working sort of on the ground. So St. Ives Eco Action is really uh, an action research project uh, based in St. Ives where I live, Market Town, um, about 13 miles west of Cambridge, as you probably know, with a population of 17,000. So I'll sort of run through uh, where we've got to and what the story is here and really interested in people's thoughts, questions, ideas of how we can, if there are ways in which we can chunk down some of the big, uh, you know, hairy, audacious uh, intangibles to meaningful chunks to people to engage with on the ground. So St. Ives Eco Action, it's not very imaginative, but it says what it does on the tin, so to speak. And um, uh, I'll just go back to that slide for a minute. Um, about two years ago, uh, just over two years ago, um, I sort of thought, what's happening locally here in St Ives um, around climate change? What are the levels of awareness? The District Council had not declared a climate emergency, still haven't, um, a bit behind the curve. Um, uh, and neither had the, the town council either. So I just thought, do you know what, I'll just call a meeting, see if I can get the town council to sponsor it, which they very kindly did. I have a friend, friendly sort of town councillor who was very um, sympathetic to the idea and um, got them to uh, pay for the hire of one of the local church halls for an evening in January. I thought, I am just stuck some posters up around town and thought about five people would turn up. Anyway, uh, about 80 people turned up on a cold winter's night in July, uh, in January, and that's where it all started. So uh, just to, these are some of the slides that I sort of try to use to bring home to people that you know, climate change is happening. It's real, it's urgent. So many people still don't get it, maybe never will. I don't know, but I like to include slides like this to try and just, uh, when people do uh, listen, who are perhaps not fully climate literate, they can begin to go, oh, hang on a second, maybe there is something here. So this is one of the slides that I use, which you may already have seen about water levels uh, and, and flood levels and, and where Cambridge and, and areas that we all live in uh, uh, stand in relation to that. Then try and sort of look at things like, this is St. Ives last year, um, which was, Often it floods, there are flood meadows, that's what flood meadows are there for, to absorb the water um, overflow when it rains heavily. Um, but this was a particularly um, uh, high uh, uh, water level um, at Christmas last year, and the water literally was lapping up at the doorsteps of people whose doorsteps it doesn't usually lap up on. So I think events like this really do bring home how, uh, how our climate is changing. Um, one thing I always think about Cambridgeshire is that there are things that, sh that have shaped the people and the landscape. Water is one of them, uh, and, and, and the agriculture and farming is another. And if we can really engage with those and work out what that means for us here in Cambridgeshire, we can really crack this. And I sort of try and think, what are the key, what are the simple things people can get hold of that can sort of relate to and draw upon the heritage where they live, their grandparents or their families or something like that. This is a really powerful image, which I actually love. Uh, and I, uh, this is an image from the Fen floods in 1947, uh, which show which there were incredibly um, high water levels from snow melt coming down the river, um, the great ooze, and there were high tides as well. And the combination of that led to the banks of the great ooze to overflow. And so it was really touch and go over a few nights to stop the river banks from bursting. and prisoners of war were helping, communities were helping, farmers were helping, et cetera, et cetera. So some great um, heritage footage and photographs and images about how communities have worked together over the years in extreme weather conditions and how that has shaped our landscape and the people and the attitude that still 
um, uh, that attitude of resilience uh, and community building. So I try and weave those into some of the things that we do. Anyway, going back to lives, here we are. Historic market town, notable for its bridge, which you may, if you mean that's it, I'm sure you're familiar with it, and its wonderful markets. And it's been a market town for centuries. I was there today, sadly a, a little thin on the ground, but nevertheless, uh, it's a buzzy place. It's got a feisty spirit of independence. It was um, home to Oliver Cromwell for a while. And there's a, actually a great community here. Um, and there's a bunch of quite motivated people. But as with a lot of things, there's a lot of people that do their own thing and nothing ever really joins up very well. And there's perhaps some historic tensions between the district council and the town council. So decision making perhaps isn't as slick as it could be. And uh, usual stories of um, a sort of disengaged electorate that don't feel they can make a difference. So going back to the cold foggy night in St Ives, January 2020, just as the result of putting posters up and telling all my friends to tell all their friends that we were having a climate event. Very kindly got um, um, Brian Eversham of the Wildlife Trust to come and give a sort of keynote speech and, and got a few other people, some local people to talk about what they were doing in the town already around conservation and nature. Um, and somebody from Cambridge, Chris Poynton, who you may know, to come and talk about data and the importance of data. We got a real buzz. There are about 80 people and you can see the people there in the church hall chatting away. We wrote things on post-it notes and, and looked at maps and um, generated really a strategy from that. Local action, what does it look like? Riding on the energy from that, it really surfaced some key people who were clearly felt quite strongly and cared about the town. My whole sort of campaigning message around this has been, who cares? Do you care? How can we care together? How can we build a community and show that we care um, and work out what we can do to generate that passion and love for where we live into something that is going to help to influence the changes that we need to make? This is just a local rag, the river porter, and this is just some of the examples. But I had to do a lot of the writing of this. What I found is, as I'm sure you all know, you have to put in so much energy to get things going and you have to really be careful about the time that you spend because you can burn out because it's a never ending sort of um, thing to do. So, but this is, uh, there's a family here on the right who bought some land and they're rewilding it. So we're all just identifying each other, I think. Uh, and it's been a really good exercise in, in, in finding out who cares basically and who was willing to do something about uh, uh, the environment and to help to reach net zero. During lockdown, um, a, one of the people that surfaced um, was a graphic designer. And so when we were all sort of shut away, uh, we were all being creative and dreaming dreams of uh, visions of, of what net zero St Ives could look like. And so we tried to keep any campaigning message we've done really bright and light and action focused and have activated some of our sort of little logos and brands as and when things have got the energy or have surfaced and are growing. And so it's really been an experiment in, in communications, um, in what it is, where the energy goes, what, what is the impact of COVID, how does the community work together and what catches the imagination. And it still is an experiment in that. We've done things like had a stall on the local market, um, We've done leaflets. We've tried to get a repair cafe up and running. Uh, it's been a real struggle. So I think my experience is it's really difficult to get things going. Um, no matter how many people are interested, nobody's really willing to put the effort in. It's in. So we've got lots of, again, we've got some, got a good background there in, in the branding. And so on. These are just some of the things, and, and you may know, it's some of the easy things that people like, like litter picking or um, uh, people have caught on to that so we just set up a Facebook group the St Ives Against Rubbish and got the town council the St Ives in Bloom group the Rotary Club to all back that that's largely been driven by me and then people have just caught on posting pictures of what they litter and it's just beginning to raise awareness that was launched a year ago um, you can see there's a great bunch of young people there again it's a small community but we look like we're doing a lot of things uh, and I think part of this is how you, the small things that you are doing, how you can then communicate those. So it gives the impression that perhaps there's more going on than there actually is. But again, we've got a great graphic designer, but he's been doing a lot of this for, for free, for voluntary. Um, and we can't keep doing that. We have to value, I think, um, the work that everybody's putting in and try and sort of make that 
and more. It's not an additional, it's a necessity. All of this is a necessity. St. Ives, just going, reality, you know, how do you engage people? What is the reality? St. Ives Town Centre, I mean, St. Ives is beautiful. It's got flood meadows. It's gorgeous. It's great. I went cycling down to Swayze yesterday. I went cycling along the path in the river uh, on Sunday. It's beautiful. But the reality is St. Ives Town Centre is a car park, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. And this was just pictures I took literally yesterday. You can see on the left, no parking, you know, except for disabled and loading. Yet you see cars parked there that don't move for three hours. Um, you can see the town centre, you get triple parking, parking on the uh, memorial there. Parking in the middle picture there, you can see, uh, which is down to the bridge, which is supposed to be load loading only, is full of cars. Um, and the picture on the right is just an example of the, the pavements. So let alone no space for cyclists, even the pavements are crooked and wonky and dangerous, particularly if you're elderly. So these are just some of the practical things that, you know, forget climate change. We're just talking about some basic, um, general, um, you know, um, improvements. Uh, but uh, climate change certainly uh, uh, is a reason to, to act more quickly. I always think, what are the things that people can catch on? What are the imaginative? What, how can we be imaginative? I always say there's no reason why St Ives shouldn't become the cycling town of Cambridgeshire. There are so many good reasons why it should. Um, and we've got some great community members here standing there. You've got Nick, the town councillor, Philip, who's an international conservationist, and um, Chris, who's the assistant uh, head of uh, one of the schools. Um, and we were standing in the park talking about a wildflower project. We've got some great cycle shops. We've got Tom's Cakes, and they're a nice picture of a cycle by the river. Again, we've got lots of the ingredients and it's a real challenge. And I look to people like CamCycle to help us with the campaigning expertise that we're gonna to need to take this forward. And also to really influence, I mean, local uh, engagement in local democratic systems, um, because in reality, the consultation and the quality of the consultations locally I have never seen a, a good consultation conducted. I've taken part in lots, you see no results, you never hear the results, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so what are the uh, challenges there? I talk to people who want to make a difference in the town. They say they joined the town council thinking they could, they left after eight weeks because it was just not going anywhere. So I think there are some real issues around how we can be really democratic uh, and speak and take action in a way that um, empowers people. But we need more leaders and we need to learn. So great learning, really need to learn from cancer because I think there's some really superb campaigning expertise there. I've launched something called Eco Action Voices, which is how we mobilize, just providing a your voice matters. Um, and seeing who surfaces. We've got a sort of core following of about 30 people. I've got a mailing list of about 20, uh, 200 people and other people follow on Facebook, the various groups. And I've just sort of got managed to get the church to um, provide the town, the church hall for free on a Saturday, once Saturday a month and said climate cafes come along and, and see who turns up. And it's generating uh, lots of interesting discussion, but it's a real challenge of how we turn that, those ideas into action and galvanize the community so that we can do things like stop the town center being a car park and make it a town for all. Um, there's a lot of work there. We've got the ingredients, but it takes so long. Our campaign, Eco Action On Your Bike. Now I know if, again, if we had the resources, we had the time, we could launch this. We've got the cycle shops, we need the communities. I and mean, it's really about communications. Um, and uh, again, I, this is where I look to you and to the people who are watching tonight to if you have any ideas of how we can um, galvanize local support, how we can campaign effectively, how we can draw upon and draw strength from uh, communities which are more established and more experienced. And I'd love to hear that. Equally, if there are any people listening in from St. Ives, and I know there might be one or two, you know, how can we join up um, to uh, really be more visible and vocal in what we're trying to do. The policy environment has never been more favorable. I know that the, uh, the combined authority have, uh, are in the process of approving budget, which is gonna make it a little easier. So how do we uh, galvanize ourselves now as a community to really position ourselves to think big and to know that the sky's the limit here. So thank you very much for listening.
Thank you so much, um, Helen. It's really fabulous to hear about all the things that you've been doing um, with the uh, Action Group in St Ives. Um, and as you say, you're at this stage where you, you can see that there's a huge amount of interest, um, but equally, it's now about turning that into something that's going to start moving towards some of those recommendations that Rhiannon was referring to earlier. Um, and Rhiannon, I wonder if I can come to you um, first on this. Um, to ask you to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the recommendations on transport and what we, I mean, um, Helen was talking about wanting to look to camp cycle and, and think about, well, how, how do we do it? How do we turn um, the idea of, of something into, into greater action? But what are, what are the specific things that you think that we really need to be focused on now um, from the point of view of your report's recommendations? Um, yeah, so the report's kind of main recommendations on transport cover two areas. Um, I'd say the first one is electrification of um, cars um, and the bus fleet and the council fleet. Um, but I think kind of as we all know that just taking the number of cars we have and electrifying them is very much not the answer to like transport problems um and yeah we can't have like unsustainable levels of car use even if they are electric cars um so that's kind of one one part of it but obviously not the whole picture um and then another is a reduction in kind of car miles themselves and what that kind of requires is a massive investment in public and active transport and there's no kind of um kind of beating around the bush when it comes to that like it, the public transport in the region needs a massive massive investment and also a kind of strategic change as well so kind of we recommended a strategic bus review that prioritizes affordability and reliability of services um we had a lot of people in the consultations ask for a review of public ownership of buses um, and kind of if there was a case to take it back and take buses in back into public ownership, um, in particular in kind of rural areas where the routes aren't profitable and then people don't get served um, their needs. Um, and then, of course, that also requires a big investment in cycling and walking infrastructure. Um, so that includes kind of making sure that all major employers, all major housing have um, transport hubs that can accommodate um, cycles, that can, that can link up to public transport. Um, and ensuring that things like cycle routes and bus routes are kind of linked so you're, you're not like totally disjointed in terms of the way that you're the way that you're planning your transport um so one of the key recommendations is to particularly look at cycling infrastructure within towns and then between towns such as um uh, kind of like between market towns look at the use of e-bikes and how kind of those longer routes can be facilitated with things like e-bikes um and i think one of the really key recommendations is that it says like very clearly that alternatives alternatives to road investment should be prioritized so for appraisal for investment so that includes active travel that includes public transport that includes light rail um or bus rapid transit all that kind of thing so anything that's not new road building should be prioritized um because there is a really big uh, kind of problem with the idea of supply and demand in road building and lots of um not just locally but lots of lots of local policy on planning policy on transport has fallen into building more roads thinking that you need more roads or is actually building more roads makes you need more roads so and 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 previous transport policies in the area have really um followed that logic um so something that we were really keen to challenge and make sure that we um were kind of articulating alternatives to was the idea that if you have a traffic problem you need to build more roads um because that kind of locks you into dependence on cars um and that was what a lot of people felt was that it was a dependence on cars rather than um a choice to um always use cars basically um and yeah i've kind of mentioned some of the barriers and challenges that were identified um but i think basically like it comes down to things being available to people and things being affordable to people like you can't and that's that's kind of it and things people feeling safe as well especially on cycle routes um so things like separated cycle routes um people were um highlighting is really important to them um and 
yeah and I think there's also as well as kind of the practical benefits of people saving money and being healthier there's also really good evidence that like towns that have more public transport have more community cohesion as well and because you, you actually get like a lot of like mixing and community atmosphere created by having a better public transport network um and so that's something that I'm really interested in um and kind of I guess a final so kind of cycling electrification bus reform um, and then I kind of touched on it, but in particular, uh, including transport in planning and development and um, any kind of planning services. So like how can so how can things be actually closer to people so that they're not having to work in Cambridge and if, unless, if they don't want to, you know, and how can um, kind of local services be close to people and how can smaller communities be connected, not just kind of the big ticket employers or the big ticket cities. Um, so yeah, that was some of the stuff that we recommended. Oh, thank you. Uh, it makes me think about um, one of the sort of strap lines that we use, which is about making active travel the, the safest, most convenient and the most pleasant option for people. Um, and so a huge amount of our work goes into, you know, affecting that. Um, and one of the things, Helen, thinking about the, the little things that people do one of the things that we do is that we go through every single planning application that comes through in Cambridge and we look at the provision for cycling, for example, and then we share that with our members. You know, this is an example of something that's come up in planning. This is the provision that has or hasn't been created for cycling. Um, and therefore, what should we do about it? And of course, some of the sort of as as a, an organisation, the size we are, we don't always have capacity to pick up on every single one of those. And um, so we tend to obviously focus on the bigger developments um, where cycle infrastructure is, is you know, is found wanting. Um, but of course, the issue that we have beyond that is then how do you lobby um, people, the, the decision makers to care about that and to and to really make a difference? What would you say about that, Rhiannon? Like, how do we? Can I just oh, I um, jump in Sorry, yeah. as well? Because we had um, a query earlier in the week um, on Twitter discussing this from um, Peterborough Cycle Forum, because, I mean, there's been a combined authority board meeting um, last week. And there's still, like you say, there's still a lot of the projects are road building, you know, and when we come to um, there's going to be a new university in Peterborough. And they're still sort of talking about, oh, we need roads to get there. And actually, a lot of students won't be travelling by car. You know, we know that um, in the new, there was a new training centre in Alconbury, which has had to sort of close down because students couldn't get there. And I um, think, you know, campaigners and also some of the councillors are sort of raising this, like, why isn't active and um, travel public transport? Why isn't that being the priority? You know, yeah, why? Uh, are our local authorities still kind of fixating on those road building schemes? Um, and, and actually some of the councillors were raising when, you know, if the budget's tight and then it gets a bit tighter, sometimes it's the walking and cycling that drop off the bottom and that's completely the wrong way around. So I'm sort of interested in how does the Commission for Climate, you know, what sort of pressure could that exert on, on the combined authority board and on other local authorities? Um, yeah, I can answer that, but I don't know if Helen wants to start with like how you, your experience of lobbying um, different local politicians. Yeah, we, we haven't actually, we've been spent the last two years actually surfacing the local issues and trying to just push a few places to see where the resistance is, where the except, where are our friends, what are the policy barriers, what do we need to be thinking about to inform where we focus our energies. Um, uh, and so we haven't actually done a lot of lobbying. Um, we try to just focus, keep it local and build alliances and friendships, which has led me to Cam Cycle, the Hunt Cycling and Walking Group, and just identifying who the friends are and where we can strengthen our, our case. And I think we're still in that space. Um, I do think there is a real issue quite at quite a senior political level uh, within some of our um, uh, larger local authorities around how we ensure that decision making or that 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 sort of three to 60 degree decision you know considerations we now have to be making is really embedded um, and I think there are some local authorities which are further ahead than others in that respect so I think and I know that the combined authority is limited in its influence but I think if the the, 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 the mood music if you like can be kept uh, playing loud and strong and the appropriate pressures can be put on and incentives placed where 
road building, you know, still um, is not the default, we must do this. And it's interesting at the combined authority meeting last week, where I think it was Councillor Fuller saying, sometimes roads just have to be built and we just have to get on with it. Um, and I, I really think that is outmoded thinking. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, it's just, I find it quite disturbing where we're still hearing that now. So I think lots of people really get the, we need to do things differently, but I just don't hear that from so many places. And this is where I think collectively we can, we need to really strengthen our voice and utilize the, the mood music that is around the policy directives to really work out what it is that is and is not acceptable and to just speak more loudly and galvanize and mobilize the community interest and make it easy to mobilize communities. Because I think if we give them a clear direction, they'll hop on, that's what I find. People will happily go along with things, but they just don't want to be involved in the, the, the effort and the strategizing sometimes. Bit of a long answer that to lobbying, but um, yeah, it requires a lot of organizational, a lot of energy. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can talk about this a little bit from my perspective as a commissioner, but also as a like as from a background in campaigning. Um, I think it's really important that um, things like evidence are really important. Obviously, I spent many many months of last year writing a whole report about evidence, but evidence is not going to necessarily change the way that things are done. And I think we've seen that kind of consistently throughout COVID, throughout the climate crisis. You know, evidence by itself doesn't doesn't always change things. Um, so I think it's really important to use evidence as a tool um, to put political, social and people based pressure. And it, evidence is like one piece of an entire toolbox that people need to make change. And I think in, in particular, I think in local government, it's really, really important to get people involved, like as you were saying, Helen, because like at the end of the day, elected council elected councillors elected politicians they work for the local community and so like community resistance or community the opposite of resistance or community demands are some of the most powerful tools that we have in improving climate policy um so yeah i think just things take time and, I, and we don't have time and that's something that i struggle with a lot um and but i think building that community power i, I don't think there's um a shortcut i think i think that's kind of the way, and having a favourable political environment is obviously very, very useful and utilising that to the best of our abilities is really important. Um, and I think something that's really important to think about is that the UK civil society infrastructure has kind of been actively disbanded a lot, and especially in the last kind of 30 years. And that kind of the networks of organising and the skills and the infrastructure that is needed to mobilise communities has been decimated. It's like it's basically since like the thin stature. So it's really, really important to think not just about, OK, like, how can we run this petition? How can we do X? How can we do Y? But how can we put in place the structures that make this organising sustainable? How can we train up young activists? How can we um, ensure that our organisations are sustainable? Um, how can we kind of build genuine coalition um, between different local groups? Um, so it sounds like all the work you're doing is super amazing, Helen. And <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah. so I think that as well as running campaigns, it's really important to think about actually the infrastructure of change and how um, a lot of that is is missing in communities um, quite, yeah, quite deliberately, I think. Um, I want to pick up, thanks, um, ladies. Um, yeah, a huge amount buzzing around there, and I feel like I'm sort of furiously making notes and pretending to just sort of look at the screen, but I'm scribbling behind the scenes. Um, there's a, um, a, a point here from Nigel, which picks up a little bit on your point about evidence um, there, Ian, and that... Um, He's saying, I wonder how many car users believe that the current transition to battery powered cars will just solve the issue of carbon emissions from motor vehicles and that there's actually no need to reduce car use. Um, I wonder if we know how much of the extent to which that's true. Um, is that the case that, that most car, use, car users think that the, the move to EV will fix the problem? First of all, I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but it would be interesting to know wouldn't it whether or not that's the evidence is really that a lot of people yeah still sort of just thinking along those lines and so until there's a kind of challenge to that way of thinking about the, the switch uh, and how we adapt yeah. to, to things I think, well and it's probably it could be an echo chamber effect but I think from what I've seen 
a lot of people are very very keen on public transport and active transport um at least like kind of thinking about the kind of ideal cities that that they that they would like but i think at the moment it's quite hard to ground that in people's everyday realities and i think that's the disconnect i think people are lots of people like and particularly in like the experience of consultations i've done like want to see a environmentally friendly socially connected region um based on like really good public and active transport but trying to translate that into the options that people face in their daily lives at the moment and that that's where the really big that's where the really really big gap is um but i think that that kind of more that that ability to imagine and that ability to ideate and that ability to say or not even imagine look at where it's been done in other areas is really really important and because part of like shifting that over to a window is shifting what you believe is possible if you don't think it's possible for a rural town to have a city center without cars then you're never going to get any policies that work towards that because people don't believe it's possible so i think that's really really important but also kind of i think somebody else has mentioned in the chat talking about the other benefits right because because again i think and the environmental movement has in the past made the mistake of talking about emissions and um the climate crisis as divorced from community as divorced from people's jobs you know whereas actually there's nothing that's more intertwined with people's lives as how we treat the nature around us how we treat each other how the economy runs um and kind of really linking that is really important um kind of things like air pollution definitely really important um but also things like safety you know like and things like expenses and how expensive it is to run a car hugely expensive to run a car much less expensive to get the bus if bus is designed right um and i think another really important part of this is demonstration projects um and that's again part of this imagination theme of knowing that something is possible so i was in um i think it was brighton i was in brighton recently and there was a massive like critical mass bike ride and i think i think you do that i think some people do it in cambridge as well i'm maybe i'm maybe making that up but basically anyway the whole city center is totally overrun with cars like i drove there and i could not park anywhere and i was like oh my god i can't believe i drove here stupid um and they just do like a mass takeover of the city center with bikes i think some people were naked but like some most people had clothes on so it was like it was like a mix <laughs> but just to show that you, you don't need the cars there like you can have you can have everyone going around the city by bikes you can have a thousand people going around the city by bike and look how fun this is do you know what i mean so and so those kind of demonstration projects are so so important to people to be like oh well maybe we could do that every day or you know like a parking free day and everyone's like oh this is kind of nice you know so building in that that ability to think beyond our current reality um is so important but i've totally forgotten what the original question was so i've just gone on a little ramble um no, that's fine um plenty of good stuff in your rambling <laughs> um anna do you want to feed some of the questions um from facebook that you've picked up Yes, yeah, so we've got one here from Edward. Um, so he says, Rhiannon, in a great presentation. I look forward to reading the report. Um, but his question is, campaigners are doing a of planning initiatives. Are there any practical tools, criteria or checklists for anyone working in planning to implement your recommendations? It seems as if today's developments will lock in emission patterns and there needs to be a formal way of raising red flags, i.e. inserting the CPICC recommendations into the planning context. And also, what sort of engagement is there with like county or district councillors um, or council officers? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So there's two answers to that. One is more immediate, which is the development of the local plan. Um, and so we've been speaking to the lead person on the local plan about the incorporation of the recommendations into the local plan. Um, and that's looking quite positive, um, which is which is really, really good. Um, but one of the recommendations was a policy assessment tool for so for like all policies um, uh, uh, assessment tool um, that has not been started yet I don't think but obviously the sooner that gets finished the better um, but in the meantime kind of um, councillors who are on board with the recommendations are um, working to put them into um, the local plan which is really great um, and yes yeah, so like a lot of our work is um councillor maybe not a lot of our work i think more of our work should be councillor engagement 
Um, and I would like to do more of that, I think, um, in the future of the commission, because I think it's really important that, um, I think two things are really important. I think one thing, one thing is really important is that it's kind of cross party. And I think it's hard to make something cross party if um, like champions are one particular party. So I think like people like independent people are really good for that. Um, and I think it's also really important to meet people where they are. I think there's there's a lot of this happens in, in, in environmentalism, but generally on the left is being angry with people for not being where you are. And I understand that. Like sometimes I, you know, go to dinner parties and end up like crying because nobody understands the climate crisis. But um, kind of meeting people where they are and being able to bring them bring them into the conversation. Um, is, is really important that applies for politicians that applies for local communities um, and that very open dialogue um, is yeah is really really important I think as well that's it's interesting like what you were saying about inequality um, because for example we have a campaigner that we work with who's in Wisbeach and when he was campaigning for um, cycling infrastructure he hasn't sort of focused on the climate aspects he's focused on you know the kind of how yeah people uh it's kind of like a transport poverty really you know there are 20 percent of people in Finland that don't have access to a car and yet only one to two percent sort of cycle mm. because they just don't have the options you know so actually a lot of people are kind of trapped where they are if they don't have access to a car or you know they're sort of walking for hours a day um so I think yes yeah, sort of that mm. aspect is, is there maybe a good way in for people that are kind of a bit more sort of yeah. open to that run. Yeah, and angle. I think also in kind of answer to Nigel's question, I think there's like different analysis over whether you could just switch all of the cars to EVs. I think there's like that that's not a good idea and we don't want to do that because there's an opportunity to make things much better. Um, and then there's quite a hot debate about whether that is possible um, in natural resource terms. Um, and I think lots of people have different opinions on that. I think like my personal opinion is that you cannot have an economy that requires endless, endlessly increasing amounts of consumption of resources, whether that be like labor or natural resources. Um, but there is a, yeah, there is a very hot debate about um, that in particular. Um, so I think the emissions reductions is really, really important. Like, there's no denying that we need to reduce car use to meet emissions reductions. Otherwise, the emissions reduction targets are not going to be met. Um, and there is some analysis on that in the report, I think. But globally, the debate is like quite interesting. So, yeah. Thanks so much for your responses and thanks every, everybody. Um, I'm aware that we are now at eight o'clock um, with more sort of messages and comments um, than we really have time for here this evening. Um, so I'm I'm sad to say that we need to say goodbye to Rhiannon and Helen, let them go back to their evenings. Um, but if you do have other things that you want to, um, specific things that you'd like to sort of uh, ask, then do um, get them on Cyclescape um, in the monthly meeting um, thread and uh, and I can forward them over to the ladies and just see if there's anything that they can give us an answer um, with via email. Oh, sorry, just a couple of things to pass on to Helen. Um, we have um, just a recommendation from Gabrielle of Milton Cycling Campaign that says um, maybe look out for some grant opportunities because that's really helped their group um, sort of start to take action in around the village. And then we also had uh, Libby, who is based in Bury St Edmunds, and she said as well, maybe, is there any, I don't know, option of linking up with across county, uh, across the border as well, I guess, um, all these little groups sort of around us. So, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. So um, enormous thanks, ladies, again. Um, we really, really appreciate both the work that you're doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis on this, and particularly when you're leading such busy lives around it as well, um, but also, of course, for coming to talk to us this evening. So um, huge thanks. Um, we're going to turn over to our um, campaigning um, update in a moment. So if you want to love us and leave us, then we understand completely. <laughs> and um, yeah. Um, um, Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay, um, I'm going to hand over to Anna now, who's going to give us a, a, an update uh, on our campaigning issues. Okay. Um, first of all, because we haven't had a monthly meeting since December, 
Um, I must mention again the Chisholm Trail, uh, which opened on the 23rd. So that was a, a brilliant um, Christmas present for everybody. I know it's um, much used over the holidays and, um, and, and continues to be now. Um, so <clears throat> there's a nice picture here um, that local photographer Ian Olsen took yesterday. Um, and then um, there's a picture of uh, Jim and, and some local councillors um, on the day it opened. Um, and I just like to say we, we, because it was kind of quite last minute, we didn't really, um, and, and because COVID was, was a high at the time, um, we didn't really get much kind of community pictures. Um, so if you, if you are out and about, um, do send us pictures, um, put them on social media, um, tag CamCycle or um, use the hashtag Chisholm Trail Cambridge. Um, and we're actually um, getting together on Friday at two o'clock to do a few uh, low key photos. So if you happen to be in the area, um, come and see us on the bridge and, and maybe kind of be in the background. Um, we will again have to be a bit sort of socially distanced and, and, and careful of how we do that. Um, but if you want to come along on Friday, say hi and be in the back of a photo, um, please do. Um, so our AGM was, oh, week and a half ago something like that um seems seems a long time already um and it was uh, a real delight to have uh, adam tranter as our guest speaker um so he's the cycling and walking commissioner of the west midlands and um a sort of cycling activist and uh, the man behind the sort of bikers best national bikers best campaign um and if you missed that meeting um you can catch up again with it um with that on our youtube channel um which you can get to by going to camcycle.org.uk slash videos. Um, and we've also published an annual report, um, which is at camcycle.org.uk forward slash annual reports. Um, and you can find out more about all the things we got up to in 2021 um, and some of our plans for the future, um, including our strategy, which, which has been informed by um, members and trustees and staff who will work together on um, our strategy for the next four years. Um, also at our AGM we had our um, annual trustee election, um, so these are our trustees for um, 2022, They're every, all the candidates um, that stood for that, at that election were elected um, and thank you very much to um, our trustees, previous trustees that have stood down, um, Finlay, Alec and Tom um, for all the work um, they put in uh, over the previous years um, and we do still have a few spaces on our board. Um, we really, really welcome people from lots of different backgrounds, different skills. Um, please get in touch with us, um, have a little chat about what it might be, what the role involves. You really, really don't need to have experience in campaigning, in cycling. You just have to have um, a bit of a passion for our cause and, and helping us kind of achieve more impact um, each year and, and really bringing your own experience and perspective to it um, which may be different from the ones that we've already um, got on our board or within our organisation. Um, so yeah if you're interested to find out more out, um, about becoming a trustee if you go to campsycle.org.uk um, forward slash trustees there's a link there um, to, become, to, for, to find out more about becoming a trustee or you can get in touch with us on social media or an email um, or just come up and chat to us if you see us out and about and um, whatever is most comfortable for you. Um, the highway code has changed. Um, so that went into effect on Saturday. There are some changes um, made to the highway code, but actually really it feels like, I mean, from the media, you feel like, oh, everything's changed. It's a big drama, but actually not much has changed. It's, it's really based around, you know, common courtesy um, and things that were always there. So clarifying a few rules um, and just um, things, just putting together this hierarchy of road users, making that really clear that those, um, the kind of, yeah, those who are most vulnerable um, and in vehicles of kind of the lowest weight, um, they, they should have the most priority you know they the the bigger heavier vehicles faster vehicles um have bear the greatest responsibility so just the changes to the highway code really kind of uh, embed that um so things like for example um pedestrians if a pedestrian is crossing a side street they have priority and those vehicles um turning into it must wait for the pedestrian to cross um similarly if a cyclist is on a roundabout 
um, you know, cars must give way to cyclists coming round the roundabout, just as they would to any other vehicle. Um, so it's just sort of little changes and to the wording and things that just make that really clear that um, cyclists, pedestrians, horse riders, um, they they have priority um, on our roads. And we've um, there have a little blog post on our blog. There'll be an article in our upcoming magazine. Um, thanks to Margaret for writing that one. Um, and there's also lots of information if you go to um, like national charity Cycling UK, which this image is from, it's um, by Dave Walker. Um, and also the um, Department of Transport itself has some um, good information on their website, including just a sort of eight key changes that people should know. There's various um, kind of videos and things out there. Uh, a little bit of an update um, on campaigning, where we are. Um, so there's some Mill Road workshops coming up this month, um, just starting that new consultation on Mill Road um, and what that street should be like in future, um, and how to reduce traffic and make that a more pleasant place, um, more accessible for everybody. Um, we've been promoting some consultations uh, around the Fenland active travel strategy um, and some changes in Soham. Um, our volunteers have been working on our response to um, an update of a planning application, a big planning application in Cherry Hinton, um, which will affect the Tins cycle path and its very popular cycle route. Um, then we have some national news. Um, so Active Travel England, which is the new um, funding body for active travel. So it'll be managing all the walking and cycling funding, um, but it will also be an inspectorate for active travel. So it would be really um, a bit like a sort of Ofsted style body. So Ofsted for education, this will be for active travel, really kind of almost rating local authorities, holding them to account um, if, if the facilities aren't good enough, um, then funding will be withdrawn. They might have to pay funding back um, and they might not get funding for any road building schemes or, or other similar transport schemes. Um, and also it will be a, um, I've forgotten the a statutory consultee for planning applications. So I think it's um, developments over 150 houses, Active Travel England will have to, uh, will be a consultee on that, see if they are doing um, what they should be to um, really enable active travel and sustainable transport. Um, and this was announced on the day of our AGM, um, just in the morning, so that was a, lots of cycling news on that day um, and one of the things that came out of that as well was that there were some um, announcements about some extra pots of funding um, so they, that's not new funding it's funding from within um, the government's two billion pounds for active travel which is I think over two or three years um, so one of the new bits of um, funding out of that pot um, was a half, just over half a million pound grant um, to improve Cambridge cycle point and um, we've worked hard, um, Roxanne, who's our cycle theft specialist um, within um, Cam Cycle, she's been really um, working hard um, with local stakeholders and tackling problems of cycle theft um, in our area. Um, and so she worked hard to help prepare the bid for that. Um, and that funding, uh, Greater Anglia will be working on that soon and that funding will um, allow them to improve uh, both security at the Cambridge Cycle Point cycle, um, Station Cycle Park, um, but also accessibility um, so that people with um, larger bikes, non-standard bikes, or people that have disabilities need to be able to sort of cycle straight to their parking space. Um, it would be a lot more accessible um, for everybody, um, not just people that can, for example, lift, lift a bike up onto the top deck of a two-tier two-tier parking rack like these. This is a, another campaign we've been working on just in the last week. Um, so we found out that the County Council are planning to install some um, electric vehicle charge points. And I think um, some of this has been driven by local resident requests and local councillors. Um, and it's great, you know, we, we, we all need that. Um, but we are very concerned that some of these have been um, allocated for pavements and really we, you know, we don't need any more hazards on pavements. Pavements need to be accessible for the people walking, um, using mobility aids, pushing push chairs. Um, so we have our members, we've encouraged our members to respond to this. Um, 
say, um, you know, any EV or car infrastructure should be in the carriageway. Um, and the second point is that as some of these were planned for Riverside and we are really concerned about that um, being a popular walking and cycling route. Again, you know, um, actually what we need for Riverside is to have less parking spaces and more space for walking and cycling. Can get really, really quite busy there, especially sort of during the pandemic, people are trying to get their daily exercise. It's, it can be really quite narrow and we need to improve that Riverside as an active travel route. Uh, again, not, not um, sort of blocking up the pavements and, and drawing more traffic um, into quite a narrow space. Um, so thank you, thank you to um, all the people that responded to our request. I think we've been copied into about 60 responses of people writing to the council um, about this. So that is a really, really brilliant response. Um, thank you for getting involved and um, we'll wait to see what comes back. And that is the end for now. I'm sure I probably have missed things. Um, so raise questions if there's anything you want to um, find out more. Let me just have a look. Okay, Gabrielle says, do we know why the cycle point plans do not include the improvement of the actual racks, which are currently not very well secured to the ground? Um, I don't have the details of what, I mean, I only have the details from Great Triangle's press release of what that includes. So I think, I think, it might well include um, better securing of the stands, um, but I'll try and find out and get back to you on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't, I don't, I certainly don't have information to say it definitely doesn't. Um, so um, we'll try and find out. Thanks for the roundup, Anna. Um, it's always really good to be reminded and um, yeah, and lots of good news um, at the moment, which is which is really nice to see to balance some of the more disappointing things that we're having to tackle. Oh, thank you everybody who's participated or um, just watched us this evening and um, we hope you all have a lovely evening and maybe see some of you in the catch up afterwards. Okay, thanks, bye. <laughs>